Good evening. It's time to get started tonight for our Bible study time. <clears throat> it's good to see everyone here. We're continuing our series of lessons tonight in the Spiritual Sword uh, periodical. And we're going to be, we're going to kind of skip ahead a little bit this week. We're going to be on page 27 if you have, a, have the book. Looking at the topic, why we teach that we can know the truth. Why we teach that we can know the truth. The question we oftentimes hear is, does it really matter what I believe as long as I believe in something? Have you ever heard that before? We heard that or some variation of that before, haven't we? One of my favorites is, well, that's just your interpretation. You ever heard that? Talking about something from the Bible? Well, those p people that would hold that, those thoughts, I think sometimes really don't know what they're saying because if we can all agree that a certain thing is true, then there's no variation, is there? I oftentimes like to use the argument 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's a mathematical truth, isn't it? No matter how sincere you are, no matter how deep your belief is or your conviction that 2 plus 2 equals 5, is it ever going to be true? It's not, is it? It's, in, it's an impossibility. Now, many people get into the religious realm. They think that truth is just whatever you believe it is or whatever you've been taught that it is and those sorts of things, and there's danger in that. And we'll talk tonight and throughout this article, if you've had opportunity to look at it and read it, and we won't get through it all tonight, by the way, I'm sure, but <clears throat> I would submit for our thinking that this is important this matter of truth and that we can know truth is important because all questions related to what we believe religiously, spiritually, biblically, really go back to this one, doesn't it? If we can't, if you're going to approach someone and engage in a Bible study with them and, they, and you can't establish the, the bedrock foundational belief that God's Word is all truth, absolute truth, no variation, no adulteration, whatever you want to call it. If you can't agree on that with that person, how effective are you going to be in teaching them anything? Or if you're the one who holds that it's variable or it's up for a private interpretation, those sorts of things, you're not going to be, nobody's going to be able to teach you anything, are they? Because the the target's always going to be moving. It's, many people think today that truth is fluid. Now, what do I mean by that? Hmm? It changes with times and cultures and people's attitudes and their likes and their dislikes and all that, Brian. Right. Yeah, and I think it's in the world, sometimes, oftentimes, Opinions and whatnot, you know, we say opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody's got one, but they don't do much, right? That's okay with opinions about, you know, what you're going to eat or what you like or where you want to live and those sorts of things. But when it comes to absolute truth, it, the foundation there has to be, that has to be solid, okay? <clears throat> I, I taught this series of lessons a number of years ago, maybe 10 years or more ago, so I've got, still got some notes from that class. And one of the things I had uh, written down here pointed out, the secular worldview may be explained simply as pluralism or political correctness. Have you ever heard that before? It's the idea that there are no absolutes. There's no truth. Now, these statistics are probably a little bit dated, but According to a recent poll, 66% of us believe it. Among those between 18 and 25 years of age, 72% say nothing is absolutely true. Let's think about that for a second. Nothing is absolutely true. All right? More than one half of evangelical Christians, you know they, that term is thrown around a lot, 
to, to talk about those who are more conservative in nature from a Christian perspective. 53% of evangelical Christians believe that there are no absolutes. The very statement, when someone says, quote, there is no absolute truth, end quote, is a statement in itself of belief in an absolute truth, isn't it? They're stating that you can't, there's no absolute truth. Well, how do you know that? Well, I don't know. I think you see the fallacy in that line of thinking. Virtually the same percentage of us who say there is no truth also say the Bible is truly the Word of God and accurate in all of its ways. So how can you have an opinion on one side that says there's no absolute truths, and then on the other side, yeah, I believe the Word of God is accurate in all of its ways? There's some sort of disparity there, isn't there? Yeah, many people don't know the word, what the Word of God says. Or they hold that it's up for private interpretation. It's whatever you think it says or whatever your religious authority thinks it says and, and those sorts of things. Why is it that that's so dangerous? Yeah, and again, in certain areas of our aspects of our life, that may be okay. But when you're talking about where you spend your eternity, I would submit for our thinking it matters. Truth matters. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, Gary points out that you know there's there are uh, people, really gullible people in this world who who latch on to something. It may sound pretty good, and we as we I think we may have mentioned it Sunday morning in our class in here. It's got it's sprinkled with just enough scripture to make it sound authentic, and you get someone who's a a, a good speaker, someone who's charismatic, someone who's magnetic in their personality, and they draw people away. And that's an extreme, obviously. I mean, we, thankfully, we don't see that a lot, but it has happened. You know, he, uh, Gary mentioned Jim Jones and down in Guyana and that, that group, David Koresh in Texas, the one in California where they were waiting on the comet to come pick them up and all that. So it's, I mean, it's out there. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Brenda points out that the, 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 the condition that we face in this world is that people, I think if you ask it, people, they would honestly say, yes, I want to know the truth. I mean, nobody wants to believe a lie, do they? Not, not, you know, on purpose, but I think oftentimes the way it's presented and the failure on the individual's part to check it out. You know, I've... Yeah, Brenda says that that's how she became a, a, a New Testament Christian, by trying to disprove what was being taught here. Okay? I mean, that works, doesn't it? She honestly looked at the Word of God. I mean, she was going at it kind of through the back door, but she was studying. And I, I still believe, and I know you know this is true, that the, the plain and simple gospel of Jesus Christ is still attractive today. People are still looking today. People who are sincerely looking for it and honest in their hearts and willing to search the Scriptures will find it. Okay? Paul, yes, sir. I think, uh, John 12, 48, I've, I've listened to two of the sermons from the Scriptures today. Both of them reference John 12, 48. 
John 12, 48. Let's take a moment and turn there. It's a very important passage. I actually got it in my notes, Joe, so I appreciate you mentioning it. <clears throat> Let's turn over there and read it together. This is a very fundamental passage I think for many years I missed. Um, I mean, we read the Gospels over and over in our study and classes and things, but I think this is a very fundamental statement here. Notice who's talking. If your Bible has red letters in it, you'll find this passage in red. Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 48. Jesus speaking here, He says, He who rejects Me and does not receive My words has that, or one, which judges him. What is it, Jesus? The word that I have spoken will judge you, or judge him, in the last day. Go on there in verse 48. For I, Christ, I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that I should say, and what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. There's your answer for where biblical authority comes from, isn't it? There's your answer for what's going to be on, and I don't, I don't mean to demean it here, but here's what's going to be on the final exam. I know when I was in school, we always got excited when we heard the teacher say, open book test. That didn't necessarily, I found out real quick, that didn't necessarily mean it's going to be easier. But you, it gave you some level of confidence and co comfort level that you were going to have a resource there that you weren't just going to have to rely on what was between your ears or what you prepared. Jesus is saying here, I'm telling you right now, what you're going to be judged against. When you stand before God in judgment, He's going to have your, the record of your life on one side and He's going to have his, the Word on the other side. And how you lived according to His commandments will be how you're judged. That should provide us some comfort, shouldn't it? If, if we determine that, yes, this is right, this is truth, this is absolute, God said it, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to try my best to live it. But unfortunately, many would say, well, I think. Or I feel. I don't feel like that's what it's saying. I believe X, Y, Z. And that's where the danger comes in, isn't it? Now, I'll admit to you, much, much of... Uh, you know, a lot of the things are difficult. A lot of the things are hard because they require us to change. They require us to go against our human nature oftentimes. Go against what we would want to do. Okay? Or what the world says we should do. That's what makes it difficult. But I still point back to John 12, 48. We know what's going to be, what we're going to be judged against. Joe, was that what you were trying to get across? John, right, John chapter 6, all of it, Jesus said, I'm the bread that's come down from heaven. The spiritual food that you're going to need to live in this world and to be acceptable to me and to, to have the hope of eternity and to have the hope and the possibility of your sins being forgiven and all those things, okay? All important stuff, isn't it? Jesus has provided. Now, many would say, well, Jesus is not here today. That's right, He's not. Again, the Bible reveals that Jesus is, has, has, was, has died, buried, resurrected, gone back to heaven. But did He leave us to fit, uh, flounder on our own? No. He told His apostles there, I'll, when I go away, I'll send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to guide you into... All what? What's the next word? T-R-U-T-H. Truth. 
Even the comforter won't speak of, him, of his own self. I'm paraphrasing here Jesus' words, but he will speak what's coming from heaven. Okay. I like to use the phrase, the concept, it was spoken in heaven before it was written on earth. Okay. If we can get to the point in our lives where we believe that what we have here in our Bibles, both Old and New Testament, is exactly what God wants us to have, and He spoke it, God breathed, theonoustos was a Greek word, God breathed. If we can get on board with that concept and believe that, and base our lives, spiritual life on that, we're going to be a lot happier. And we're going to be a lot better equipped to teach other people. God doesn't want us to live with doubt in our minds about whether or not this is true. It's not His nature, is it? Okay. Questions or comments? Yeah, Gary points out we, we wish we could almost open up people's heads and pour it in because they're, they're just so, it seems like dead set, going headstrong the other direction. They've got the same truth that we all have, right? If they would just look and try to find it. Uh, Matthew seven twenty one. you've heard Jerry uh, Corbin say in classes before, he wished he could take that out of the book. Because it clearly states, again, Jesus is speaking. Not everybody's going to make it. Not even some people who are, are religiously minded people. People who are quote unquote spiritually minded people. People who are good people. People who are sincere. Maybe even some of us. Okay. There's another lesson in here that uh, talks about how a child of God can fall away. Again, that's in conflict with a you know, major religious thinking today. All right? But let's quickly define what truth is. I found this dic dictionary definition. Truth is defined as conformity with fact or reality, being in accordance with the actual state or conditions and you know, oftentimes we, we define terms by what they're not. And here he defines it as not false. So the opposite of false, okay? I think we all get that. I found this um, quote here back years ago when I was teaching this class the first time. This is by W.F. Gray. I don't know who W.F. Gray was. I hope you can see that. I'll read it for you. It's entitled Truth. I am the truth. I move in a straight line. I make no concessions. The ignorant do not know me. The prejudiced cannot see me. The intolerant disown me. I am everybody's good friend and brother. To those who try to bend me, I am as hard as tempered steel. To those who, with a pure heart, seek me, I am as gentle as a mother's caress. Only once have I been perfectly embodied in a life just once also in a book. To know me is to enjoy the highest freedom. To reject me is to invite the most tragic doom. So we see there in, in, the, in those few words kind of, the, kind of a word picture of, that's being painted of truth there. Um, is truth the same as belief? Hmm? A lot of people believe a lot of things. Uh, the author here says, All of us realize that no matter how hard we may try, just believing in something will not make it so. Can you think of any uh, biblical examples of that? He cites one here 
uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. You recall what's going on there. The prophets of Baal against Elijah there on Mount Carmel. What, somebody t- give me the thumbnail sketch of that, that account there. Elijah going against the prophets of Baal. They set up the altar and everything on it. Yeah, Elijah was, it, think about it, a contest, right? A contest between the man of God versus the, uh, the men of the false gods, Baal, that many people, uh, including the king and queen and all of them, worshipped at that time. Set up the altar. You get the picture, the, the, you know, the dead animal, the wood, all that piled up there. Uh, Elijah said, okay, um, call down fire from your God, or call on your God to, to you know, burn up this altar. What did the prophets of Baal do? You remember some of the things they did? Cut themselves with swords. They danced into a frenzy, raved and pleaded. How long? The Bible says all day. Can you imagine that? You remember how Elijah said, well, you need to shout louder because maybe he's on vacation. Or maybe he's asleep. They couldn't do it, could they? Elijah said, go get water. Soak all the altar, the wood, and everything down with water. Dig a trench, a pit around the altar. Fill it full of water. And then what happened? Elijah called down fire from heaven and consumed the altar, the water, the wood, prophets, you know, the whole thing, just burn up. But thinking about those prophets of Baal, would you say they were sincere in what they were trying to do? Obviously they were. They believed that their God would act. But it wasn't true. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bob brings up a good point, and you know, talking from experience, there he points out some of the writings of Paul, Acts twenty, and uh, uh, the, the writings of Jude, and those sorts of things that that attest to the fact that what they're writing, what has been written, is is complete and it's accurate, and and it, nothing, nobody held anything back. But you talk to people and you, you try to ask them a question. Do you believe that this Bible is God's Word and it's infallible? And they'll say yes. 
But that's only to a point, isn't it? When it gets to something they don't agree with, they want to argue and say, no, that's, I, don't, you know, I don't believe that. So, again, we have to work with people, I think, to bring them along and try to help them. And, again, there may be some that we, can't, we can never get past that. We just pray that they have time and opportunity and desire that they can be reached. Okay. Um, other questions and comments? Exactly right, and we, you know, we face we face that oftentimes as we try to study with people and and talk to them about biblical things. Um, and again, you may come to loggerheads at some point, and you just got to move on. But again, you still, you know, you're still prayerful for those people and that sort of thing. You know, I made mention. I think it was Sunday morning. We're, a lot of us are familiar with the book Muscle and a Shovel. Not an inspired work, but it's a it's a good story about someone's conversion. Out of, out of a denomination, and how the, the, the Christian in there was talking to the, the one he was trying to teach, and, and he, every, every argument that the, the person had, that Michael had, he was always able to answer it with Scripture, and always able to point out God's side of it. And for many people, they've never heard that before. Okay? Yeah, it, it is, and it's sad that, that people, uh, you know, my way of thinking, Brenda, is that when I realize that I'm out of, it, when, I'm, when my life is in conflict with God and I stand in, in the face of possible judgment, eternal destruction and those sorts of things, why wouldn't I have the attitude, I'll do whatever. I'll be willing to do whatever the book says for me to be out of that situation. But they want to fight it. They want to argue it. And they, I think a lot of it's just simply because the way they've been taught. You know, falsely taught. Okay? Uh, you know, and we'll, we'll continue to talk about those things as, as time goes on because, again, it's, it's on our minds. And we, we face people and talk to people that have that, that, that hang-up and that problem of seeing what God's Word says. There's so many people that I've talked to that I would just say, I just wish that they would read the book of Acts. You know, the denominational world wants to hang their hats on John. And that's a wonderful book. Why do you think they do that? It's because some of the scriptures in there they can use to say baptism is not necessary. John 3.16 is their, their backbone scripture. Okay. And um, again... Yeah, it, thankfully God, I mean, if, if God, if that's the only inspired book that we had, things might be a little different, but I, I don't think so. I think when you get to the point, when, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, there in that same chapter, I know we're getting off the subject, but hopefully it'll help, be helpful to somebody. John 3. What does John 3, the basic conversation that's going on there, Jesus and Nicodemus, this leader of the Jew, who's, Jews who's come to him by night and says, We know, we know that you are come from God because no man can do the things that you do. Talking about the miracles and the teachings and the feeding and all that kind of stuff. Jesus launches into a discussion with him about eternal salvation. You must be born again. 
Nicodemus didn't know what he was talking about. He said, how can a man be born again when he's old? He's talking about phys he thought he was talking about physical birth, but he wasn't. He who is, and I'm paraphrasing a lot of this here, go back and read it in your private study. You've got to be born of the water and the spirit to enter the kingdom of God. Okay? There's where he's talking about baptism. Then he goes on that same conversation in John 3, 16. He who believed, you know, God sent his son, his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. They discount that first, heart, that first half of that conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus and say, you just got to believe. And I'm I, I apologize, our time won't permit tonight, but you may have heard me say before, belief is a package word. It's not just a simple mental assent that, that I believe what you're telling me is true. I believe it to the point that I'm going to do whatever is included in the package. He had to turn his back on his, Jew, on his Jewish lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. You, I've heard, um, um, oh, B.J. Clark preach a sermon on John 3.16 and that sort of thing. He said, John 3.16 is soaking wet because of what he talked about in the earlier verses. You can't separate John 3.16 from baptism, no matter how hard people try. Okay? Again, and that's not the only verse. That's not the only verse. Thankfully, we've got other Gospels. We've got the book of Acts. We've got all those things that all fit perfectly together. People will say, well, I wish, they, I wish God had just given us a laundry list of what we're supposed to do. I would submit for our thinking that we still wouldn't get it. Yes, sir. There in John 3, uh, 15, I've actually heard this been quoted that whosoever believes in me will not perish, but it says shall not, or should not perish, mm -hmm. but have eternal life. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of difference in that word. Though. Yeah, there's a lot of difference between should not perish and shall not perish, right? The text says should not perish. It's still, that throws the honest back on me to do what belief means. Okay? I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. Yes, sir. I was just going to make a statement based off of what you, you said a direct inference or direct command about, you know, if God told us everything we couldn't do, then, you know, the books of the world couldn't contain all that kind of stuff. It kind of reminds me of John 21, 25, where it says, you know, all these miracles and things that, that Christ did, the world would Yeah, yeah, very good point. It's, I think it's a fundamental in some of these discussions we get into. Uh, you know, Brian made mention that everything that Jesus did while he was on his on this earth is not recorded in this book. But what is there is for so that we will believe. If he had, if we had another fifty books, is our belief going to be any? stronger than what it should be based on what we do have. Okay. Another point there is that God told us, told us what He wants from us, not what we should, you know, not... He didn't have to say, He told us what He wanted, so He didn't have to say what He didn't want, okay? We just stick with what He wants and we'll be fine. We have hard enough time doing that sometimes. Yeah, a, few, uh, a week or two from now, we'll, we're going to get into, into talking about instrumental music. Always a hot topic. Always very controversial. Um, again, the concept of God told us what He wanted in New Testament worship. We're not talking about the Old Testament. People want to use the Old Testament and David and all that. That's fine. But we don't live under the Old Testament. All right? Um, and I'm not convinced that God ever sanctioned instruments in the Old Testament. I think he tolerated a lot of it, but that's just my opinion. We won't get off into that. But 
When you keep in your mind that God told us exactly what He wanted us to do and we do that, He didn't have to tell us, don't do X, Y, Z. Okay, does that make sense? Other questions or comments? I know our time's getting, getting gone. Don't get a candy bar, don't get chips, yeah. And tell them to get chocolate ice cream, right. That's a, that's a, a you know, elementary simple example, yeah. And that's fundamental to, to our understanding of God's Word and God's commands. The next statement here from our book says, We can know truth because its denial is logically contradictory. Some big words there. Basically what we've talked about here Truth, as we said, is that which corresponds with reality as it is. The question is, can we, know, can we know that or are we always searching? A careful consideration of the point will force one to admit that man can know truth. For whenever he says that he can't, he is involved in a serious dilemma. We won't take, have the time to study it here, but go back in your private time and read Matthew 21, uh, verses 23 through 27. Jesus here encountered the religious teachers of his day and it came up about, you know, they were always trying to corner him with a question. And all, he would always turn the question back on them with a question oftentimes. And this was over John's baptism. You remember John the baptizer? And uh, he said, is it from heaven or from man? And they thought amongst themselves and realized they couldn't answer it because both of those, if they answered one way, you know, there was going to be a group of people that was against them. If they answered in another way, another group of people were going to be against them, okay? So the thing about it is, is oftentimes we get hung up on the horns of a dilemma because we're trying to twist truth. When anyone says man cannot know truth, he's in effect saying, I know this much, that man cannot know truth. Such a knowledge claim is both contradictory and self-defeating. If a man cannot truly know truth, then he logically could not know that either, that, you know, that he couldn't know truth. It's clear that any skeptical position that tries to deny the objective reality of truth is self-defeating and must be rejected. We can know truth because the Bible teaches that we can. Knowing what the Bible says about truth and our ability to know it, we can naturally draw the following deductions about some of its qualities. And we're going to run through these very, fairly quickly. Uh, hopefully you go back in your, your own study and study some of this. Truth is attainable. What does attainable mean? It can be gotten. It can be held. Okay? Scripture references there, uh, a, few, a few of them. Jesus there in John 8, 32, familiar passage, says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He was talking to the Jews on that occasion. Again, they, were, they wanted to argue about that. He said, What do you mean be free? We've never been, you know, we've never been enslaved to anybody. Well, what they didn't realize, they were enslaved to the Romans at, on that very day. They thought because they were Abraham's offspring, Abraham's seed, they, you know, they were, the, they were it. <clears throat> he also taught them, in, you know, that they were enslaved to sin. Okay? Jot those passages down and go back in your private study tr to know that truth is attainable. Why would Jesus say you shall know the truth if it's not possible to know the truth? Has Jesus ever commanded us or suggested that we do anything or live in a certain way that was impossible for us to do? You know, our bosses may give us a command sometime or an instruction to do something that may be impossible for us to do. But that's not the nature of God. Okay? <clears throat> God's never going to require anything of us that's impossible. And so when He says we'll know the truth, it's, it's something that is possible. Truth is objective and not subjective. We could spend days talking about this. What does it mean to be objective versus subjective? There's a standard, there's a standard right or wrong. 
looking at it from a positive, there's a stand, uh, you know, Shannon said there's a standard. So there's a, there's a right and a wrong. Objective truth really uh, indicates that there's no argument. And we, we established earlier that argue, you know, truth in its very nature cannot be argued against. Okay? Does, does truth change just the, what, based on how I feel about it? It doesn't, does it? Does truth change when cultures change? It doesn't. Right. I mean, we've said before and we'll continue to, to, to teach that, that truth is not swayed by culture. And truth is the same all the time. Regardless of what people think about it, regardless of how people act towards it, regardless of how people abuse it, and those sorts of things. To say that truth is objective is to say that truth is not changed based on whether the hearer accepts it or rejects it. It is still the truth no matter how one chooses to receive it. Truth stands on its own. Truth is outside the mind of the individual and is independent of one's feelings, likes, dislikes, and preconceived ideas. You remember when Paul was teaching there on Mars Hill in, in Athens talking to all the smart people of, of that area, okay? Talked about resurrection from, from the dead, talking about Christ being resurrected from the dead. What did they say? Remember what they, their opinion of that was? They thought he was nuts. Hmm? They rejected it. Their rejection of that truth, did it make it any, any less true? No. It is the truth regardless of how the hearer chooses to handle it. Couple that thought back to Joe's scripture in John 12, 48. Okay. Yeah. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Right. What does that mean? Part of the truth? Some of the truth? Half false? Half true? No. All means all. Truth is absolute. What does absolute mean? Without a doubt. Complete. Unchangeable. Truth does not change with the passing of years. Time does not make it more true or diminish its truth worthiness. Our culture has been influenced by the modern philosophy of subjectivism, which wants to view truth in a fluid form. Simply stated, truth is what works. What may be true in one situation today may find itself to be false in other situations in the future. That's the world in which we live in. And that has, that has bled itself over into spiritual matters. And that's where the danger comes in. <clears throat> Our time is up. Any last questions or comments before we close? I would leave you with the thought that truth matters. God has given us everything that pertains to life and to godliness in His Word. He's given us a brain. He's given us ability to read it, to understand it. The question is, are we going to make application of it in our lives? Gary. He gave us the warning about adding to and taking away from it. In light of these things, God calls us to love the truth. Why should we love the truth? Because anything else is not going to save us, right? Truth will set us free. The truth will set you free. Okay. 
you know, we get criticized because we, you know, we talk about the Bible. We try to urge people to read the Bible, study the Bible. And I know you get tired of hearing that. But it's because we love the truth and we love the souls of men that we keep trying to promote that. Yes, sir. Sometimes we get excused from being unloved. And I think people's idea of love, I've had friends that tell me they, they, they want to they, whatever a fellow believes and believes and it works for him, that's great. But I'm not going to think it's kind of an unloving thing to tell them being any different. And I know we're supposed to be, have tact and stuff, but like now they really bad to even, you got to accept everybody where they're at. You know, God's unconditional love. Yeah. Well, I mean, you don't take it just to a point, you know. Yeah. People, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, the Bible teaches that we're to teach the truth in love. We're to approach people with, rever- with respect and with, uh, you know, friendliness and love and compassion and all those kind of things. So, but the world has got it upside down. Because they say that when I, you know, if I tell you that there's a certain way that God expects us to live and it's different than the way you're living, they want to say you're unloving for pointing out the truth. Well, I've known people who want to go to a congregation that accepts everybody. The, the concept of accepting everybody, did Jesus accept everybody? Mm-hmm. He did. But did he ever tell one person to stay in your sin, it'll be okay? He did not. It is not unloving to tell people, again, in a loving, caring, compassionate way, that the way you're living is not in accordance with God's Word. Period. The end. Thank you.
If you're using a songbook for uh, tonight, our song of encouragement will be number 714, 714. We'll be opening up with number 682. We'll sing both verses, and then Brother James Chen will lead us in prayer. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved ye the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and upon the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people <clears throat> Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory great things he hath done great things he hath taught us great things he hath done and great our rejoicing through jesus the son who purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Let us pray. The most loving Father in heaven, we are so thank you for giving us another day of life. And we thank you for you love us so much and you care for so much. And uh, we are happy and we are healthy and we love you very, very much. And uh, because your love and your patience and your kindness, your, it's, it, will everlasting, it will everlasting forever. And uh, we know all this thing you give it to us is show your mercy, show your grace. We appreciate very much. And uh, we know we are still living in an imperfect world, imperfect world. We still come across a lot of issues on this world. Even currently, we're still facing a lot of issues, such as uh, the war between Ukraine and Russia and create a chaotic of the whole world, chaotic situation for the whole world. Also, the COVID-19 and the Omicron still with us. It seems not go away pretty soon. We still have issue with that uh, pandemic. Also, our economy seems like in great, in not great shape since January. Um, we face a lot of uh, the great inflation, uh, all the food price and the uh, fuel price goes skyrocketing, and everybody feel the financial stress. Also, uh, everybody feel the pinch in their wallet because because this, uh, the war, not the Ukraine and war in Ukraine and Russia. Also, the China had a COVID shutdown and closed a lot of uh, manufacturing, so the supply chain in, in, in is not in, in the moving smoothly, so we have a lot of uh, financial issue. And uh, however, it's not permanent. Everything is a cycle. Eventually, uh, we believe it will come to, a, to, a, to an end. 
in this country, we still have a lot of um, facial, uh, no, no, racial uh, issue because a lot of people feel like uh, being mistreated. In reality, we have to be face a fact. We live in the perfect, we are not living in a perfect world, but this country, we have freedom. We have very, very good respect to everybody. So even we face a lot of a senseless killing in school, in church, in subway, but those things, we believe that the law enforcement will take action and make, make it worse better, make it work better. And also, this world, we are still facing some, uh, like a global warming issue. Uh, the, the, the attic, the a attic, ice is melting, the world's sea level has increased to three or four inches every year. And uh, the, the weather patterns are completely out of, out of whack. Even the, in the Gobi Desert and the Sahara Desert had a snow. In the India, Momba, Mumbai had a snow. We haven't seen that over a thousand years, but for some reason it's happened. This abnormal situation is not, it's not God's will because God created the world. It's been exist over, over two million years. It's all man-made because man-made caused all this disaster issue. So we have to ask God, give it the wisdom and give it the courage to face this issue. Uh, we, we ask God to grant us the, the serenity to accept the thing we cannot change, and also had the courage to change the thing we can, and give us the wisdom to know the difference. And all, it's my personal belief, if we are do our, our uh, disciplinary, act, disciplinary, disciplinary act, and follow the God's guidance, and God's mercy helping him will give us great help, everything will come to a great result, come to a good end because we know God's way is perfect. God's word is proven. And uh, he's a shelter for everybody in trusting him. God will listen to us when we are in difficult situation and because uh, he cared for us. And uh, God will uh, answer our prayer and uh, provide everything we need because uh, if we can uh, what maintain contentment and uh, being peaceful with God. And the, the God is so, is, no, is God knowing all things about us. He created the heaven and earth and he even gave us the Bible to study and to learn his will. So if when we learn the will, learn his will, we put in practice that God, the world will be a whole lot better condition. Also, in order to prove his love us, ultimately love us, the mercy love us, he sent his only beloved son come to earth to show us how to live, how to uh, apply his, how to give us the word of God, give us the truth, because we know that Christianity is workable in history proven reduce the crime rate, reduce the poverty, re reduce the, the sl slavery. And we know it's proven truth, proven work. So it is truth. So the God word is truth. We can 100% trust him and believe in the word is truth. And uh, so we know that God always emphasized the best way to live is love our neighbor. If we are love our neighbor, there will be have no war. And uh, also, love is patient, is kindness, and it's never fail because God told us. So we should always remember the God's teaching and uh, apply the biblical principle in, in this world, in this country, in this community, in this church. And this church is proven evidence. We love each other, we apply God's biblical principle and also only everything follow the gospel teaching. So that's follow the truth. 
So that's the right, right way to do. We know that God cares for us, God loves us, and God watching over us because we are all his children. And if we can love God and follow his word, and uh, I believe we will have a great future. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We always consider it a privilege to pause at our midweek Bible study and take a moment to realize that there may be some in our audience that are not Christians, not having done the things prescribed in the New Testament to become Christians, be added to the Lord's church. The song that we're going to sing that Brian has selected here for our invitation is entitled Trust and Obey. In our adult class here in the auditorium tonight, we talked about the concept of truth in context of God's word being absolute truth, unchangeable. It's not changed by opinions. It's not changed by culture. It's not changed by time. It's always the same. We can take great solace, I think, in that, knowing that one thing in this world that does not change is the truth of God's word. First verse of this song says, When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. When we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. We have to trust that what God's word reveals to us is true. We have to trust that God can do and will do what he says in his word. And then we have to obey. We have to take it upon ourselves to, based on our trust and our belief and our faith in God's word and the truth of it, something we have to do to obey. My favorite verse in this song is verse 4. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. God wants our lives fully. He wants all of our lives. He doesn't want us to compartmentalize our lives into uh, different segments and sections. Christianity is, is such that it defines us. It's not what we do occasionally. It's what we are. To me, that's a concept of laying those things, those worldly things on the altar, giving them over to God, fully trusting in His Word and obeying it. Tonight, if you're here, not a Christian, the Bible says that if you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess the wonderful name of Christ before this group, Continue to confess him as you live your life each day. Be baptized in water, meeting the cleansing blood that washes away sin. Acts 2 and verse 47 says at that point Christ will add you to his church. He also requires those of us who are Christians to live faithful. Revelation 2 and verse 10, it's the words of our Lord. It says, be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. Tonight if you're here as an individual who needs to put on Christ in baptism, we're, we stand ready and willing for that. Or if you need to come back, be restored to your first love, we're here as well. If you have need of the invitation, would you stand and as we sing. Oh, 
Be seated, please. As we made mention of, uh, there's a gospel meeting going on downtown at the convention center, and Joel and his family are there tonight. He was speaking there tonight, so that's the reason they're not here. Um, I think a few of our other folks have gone down to support that meeting tonight. That will continue, by the way, through Friday of this week uh, at 7 p.m. each night. So if you can avail yourself of that, I know. That would be a, a wonderful time uh, and support that, that meeting. By way of updates to our sick, uh, Joel left me a, several here updates. Dottie Dixon, that we made mention of Sunday, it's Janice Ritchie's mother, continues in the hospital in Knoxville. She has improved some, but they're awaiting test results from a biopsy to determine next steps. We'll continue to remember uh, Dottie Dixon and Janice in our prayers. Uh, Rick Cook, this is Luanna. Williamson Cook's uh, husband has been in the hospital at Memorial having tests run after having some chest pains last night. I assume he's still there. Um, I hadn't seen any, any further updates from that. Gary Colley, this is uh, Glenn Colley's dad and Hannah um, Gieselbach's grandfather, a uh, longtime gospel preacher, has been very ill recently as it is in the ICU. We remember Glenn, uh, Gary Colley in our prayers. We received word that Catherine Bell, uh, many of us know Catherine Bell, remember her from uh, Red Bank years ago and uh, White Oak and other places, passed away on Monday. Her and her husband, Lori, were members at Red Bank and visited with us frequently before the pandemic. They were close friends of the Levi's, Greer's, and Shipley's. Visitation Friday from 11 to 1 at Hamilton Funeral Home on Hickson Pike there at Hamill Road uh, with a celebration of life at 1 o'clock there at the funeral home Friday. <clears throat> I want to make you aware of that, and we extend our sympathy to that family. We had a lengthy prayer list or a sick list on our bulletin from Sunday. I don't have any updates on any of those. Does anyone have? Yes, Don. Oh, okay. Jerry Smith. We had him on our many of many Saudi Daisy natives know Jerry and appreciate him for many years. Uh, former fire chief here in Saudi Daisy uh, passed away. We're sorry to announce that. I want to pray for his his family. Uh, this coming Sunday afternoon at our 1.30 service, we'll have our uh, fifth Sunday singing, so everybody please be making your plans to stay for that. Uh, VBS has been scheduled for July the 31st. That'll be the afternoon uh, of a, a Sunday afternoon, July 31st. More details later. And also we've set September the 10th for our Ladies Day. So please be making those notations on your calendar and uh, opportunities to, for us to be here for those things. Any other announcements that we need to make you aware of? If not, we look forward to Lord's Day, Bible study at 9.30, our worship at 10.25 and at 1.30. We look forward to seeing you then. Let's be standing for our closing song, closing prayer. Number 825, 825, we'll sing all three verses, and then Brother Chase will lead us in our closing prayer. Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to Him I sing, onward I go. Don't you to Him I cling, blessings still flow. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior, He loves me too. I seek His favor in everything I do. Walking with Him each day, love like the shine, doing always never refine kneeling to him I pray thy will not mine I love myself
Dear God, thank you for another day you've given us, and thank you for the rain you send every now and then to, you know, just do what we need to to stay alive. And thank you for, thank you for sending it, and every other blessing that you send our way to, just help us live in peace and comfort in this great country we live in. God, thank you for this, your for knowledge and your wisdom and laying out everything that we need to grow as Christians and as people, and just thank you for all that. Thank you for your son and sending him so that we can live with you in heaven one day. In Jesus' name, amen.